Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. Have you ever heard the phrase, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee? If you're younger, you might not have heard it. It's from Muhammad Ali. It's considered by many to be one of the greatest boxers of all time. And in all my years in the martial arts industry, I learned that this was a tried and true strategy. It's all about strategy, about being light on your feet, yet packing a powerful punch when necessary. A complete fighter, both sides of the coin. There's another phrase that I learned to be true, and that is never underestimate a woman. <laughs> I found this to be true both inside the ring and outside of the ring, being married. <laughs> Not going to say I'm a black belt in marriage yet. Maybe like white belt, a couple stripes. I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. But it is tried and true. And especially in my case, I learned this to be true. It's because the style of martial arts that I specialized in was Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And if you know anything about it, you know that this is the foundational martial art for mixed martial arts. That's what I did. I ran mixed martial arts gyms. You don't call them dojos because they're very, very informal. It's like a boxing gym, except with a cage in it and people fighting with no rules fighting. But Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is the martial art that invented the ultimate fighting championship, the UFC, mixed martial arts. A lot of people don't know this. And you see, the idea here, and this is why it caught a lot of American martial artists, boxers alike, off guard. Because the idea behind Jiu-Jitsu is that you're using your opponent's strengths against them. You're using leverage, strategy, intelligence over brute force. Oftentimes, it looks like the jiu-jitsu fighter is losing, but it's kind of like Muhammad Ali's rope-a-dope. You're just wearing them down. You can fight from your back, even, using your legs for leverage, and then tap your opponent out. Submit them with an arm lock or a choke or something like that. So, very often, you will see a much smaller, weaker opponent beating much bigger opponents. And these much smaller opponents sometimes include women. I would see this a lot in the MMA gyms, where a woman would beat a man. This is a technique that I would use when I saw someone come in the gym with an attitude problem. You'd have a big, burly guy, looks like he works out way too much, he thinks he's tough, and so I would pair him with the girl. <laughs> a 110 pounds soaking wet teenager. And quite often, almost all of the time, the girl would beat the big, burly guy to his shock and surprise. Sometimes the guy would get put to sleep, 
find himself waking up with a bunch of people staring at him laughing. You got beat by a girl. It was a great attitude adjustment. And indeed, this is what happened in the ultimate fighting championship. It left a lot of American spectators and judges alike in awe. Speaking of judges, where was he going with this? You'll see. <laughs> Today we find ourselves in the rest of the story where we're looking at the book of Judges. Last week we looked at the book of Joshua. We're going to do the first five chapters of Judges today. So we saw that Joshua was Moses' protege. They get into the promised land. There's the division of the land. They're securing some victories. Now we arrive in Judges. More victories. Very funny tale that it starts out with Judah and Simeon, two of the tribes of Israel, that is Jacob. They secure some victories. One guy, Adonai Bezik, they just kill 10,000 people. And then they kill this king, and, or well, before they kill him, they cut off his big toes and his thumbs. And that's interesting, but think about it. Try living your life without your big toes for balance or your thumbs opposable for grabbing things. And then he says something funny. He says, I once had 70 kings whose thumbs and big toes I cut off eating scraps from my table, but now the Lord has repaid me for that. We see more victories, but then in chapter 1, we see that they fail to drive everyone out of the land. So it's like this list of failure after failure after failure. When we get to chapter 2, we see this. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said to the Israelites, I brought you out of Egypt into this land that I swore to give to your ancestors, and I said I would never break my covenant with you. For your part, you are not to make any covenants with the people living in this land. Instead, you are to destroy their altars. But you disobeyed my command. Why did you do this? So now I declare that I will no longer drive out the people living in your land. They will be thorns in your sides and their gods will be a constant temptation to you. So now a new generation comes up who forgets what the Lord did for them. They don't care about it. They intermarry, and this causes them, as predicted, to worship other gods. So the Lord sends enemies to defeat them. Judges 2, starting at verse 15, every time Israel went out to battle, the Lord fought against them, causing them to be defeated, just as he had warned. And the people were in great distress. But, verse 16, then the Lord raised up judges to rescue the Israelites from their attackers. So here's where we got to pause for a second and look at the word judge or judges. We can't think of it exactly the way a judge operates in our culture today, where they're judging over legal matters and things. Yes, they do that, but they're more like governors, temporary governors for a time that the Lord appoints rule over Israel to rescue them, as it says. Sometimes they're prophets, and sometimes they're military leaders, as we'll see today. But here we're going to hit a cycle. Prosperity, peace, complacency, and that complacency will lead to sin. These five chapters cover a time period of about 160 or so years, so it's a pretty long time in short amount of text. They intermarry, chapter 3, all these different civilizations. And then we read this, Judges 3, 8. Then the Lord burned with anger against Israel, and he turned them over to King Cushan Rishathaim of Aram Naharaim. I got through that. And the Israelites served Cushan Rishathaim for eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Othniel, the son of Caleb's younger brother, Kenaz. The spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he became Israel's judge. He went to war against King Cushan Rishathaim of Aram, and the Lord gave Othniel victory over him. So there was peace in the land for 40 years. Then Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. A couple of interesting points. First judge of Israel, we see Caleb. If you remember, you're paying attention. Way back there in Numbers, 
We saw that it was Caleb and Joshua who did want to be obedient to the Lord, who did want to go to the promised land, who did trust the Lord for the victory. The other 10 scouts did not. They saw those giants, they were scared, and they said, no, no. And this is why they wander the wilderness for 40 years. But here we see Caleb's nephew here. Another interesting thing. He's another example of someone filled with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. We've seen that before, and I'm pointing it out to you. There are people who are filled with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament as well. A lot of Christians will get this wrong. They'll say, the Holy Spirit appears at Pentecost in Acts. Yeah, he does. It's an outpouring of him. But he's all over the beginning of the New Testament and the Old Testament as well. Not quite the outpouring in the Old Testament, but on selected people like judges. How many people here are left-handed? All right, I shouldn't have raised, quite a few, I shouldn't have raised my left hand. You're going to like this next story then, pay attention. I'm right-handed predominantly. How many here are old enough to have been born left-handed but then forced to use your right hand? Anyone? Okay. This was fairly common a long time ago, probably before my time. It's because being left-handed had a stigma with it in society, really not today in our culture. It could be seen as a bad thing, a disadvantage, even evil to certain cultures. So they make you right-handed. I know from being also in the music industry, there'd be less guitars to choose from if you were left-handed. They didn't make as many. So maybe you saw this guitar you really liked, but they didn't make a left-handed one. In boxing or MMA, this is called being a southpaw. And at first, this can be to your advantage if you know how to work it. And then it can be to your disadvantage once your opponent figures it out. If we keep reading, we'll see that the second judge of Israel is left-handed. They make a note of it here. Judges 3, starting at verse 12. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. Eglon enlisted the Ammonites and the Amalekites as allies, and he went out to defeat Israel, or defeated Israel, taking possession of Jericho. Remember that city? The cursed city. Find out what happens here to good old King Eglon in a minute. The city of Palms. And the Israelites served Eglon of Moab for 18 years. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord again raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed man of the tribe of Benjamin. So I'll make a short story shorter and tell you what happens here. Ehud is dispatched to get tribute money or give tribute money to this king, Eglon. So he gains access to him. He uses this to his advantage. He also decides to make like a dagger, double-edged dagger, maybe about a foot long, some say 18 inches, and he attaches it under his coat to his right thigh. Now, some commentators will say the reason they're bringing up the fact that he's left-handed is because that not only gives him access to the king, but access to the dagger. Knowing just a little bit about martial arts, if you wanted to conceal something, it's harder to use one hand to do two motions, get the coat out of the way, get the dagger. Plus, you could shield yourself, pull it out, and stab your opponent in one move, some say. But definitely, the fact that he's supposed to deliver this tribute money gives him special access to the king. He drops off the tribute money, gets about halfway home, and then turns back. And he approaches the king and he says, I have a secret for you. So the king sends all the servants out of the room. Then once everyone's away, he says, this is from the Lord. And then he stabs him. It says that the dagger gets stuck in his fat. <laughs> it's kind of a gross story because then it says his bowels come out. Disgusting. Gets a little bit more disgusting. Well, not more, but continues to get disgusting. He closes the doors, locks them, and some versions say he escapes down the latrine. They didn't have like modern plumbing like we do today, so use your imagination. <clears throat> well, the servants are outside and they're thinking, Maybe he's using the latrine. 
But he's taking way too long. Right? The paper, he's done reading that. <laughs> so they find a key, they get in, and they see the king is dead. Now, Ehud takes advantage of this. When you lose a king, what happens? There's a little bit of turmoil, some confusion. So he rallies up the troops, and he goes and attacks them, killing 10,000 Moabites. It says, so Moab was conquered by Israel that day, and they had peace in the land for 80 years. Pretty long time. Then there's a guy named Shamgar. This is what it says about him. Judges 3.21, after Ehud Shamgar, son of Anath, rescued Israel. He once killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad. If you know the word pretty well, you know this is kind of a little bit of a foreshadowing of something that Samson does, kind of similar. But that's all this section gives us on good old Shamgar. We don't know how much peace and prosperity they had during this time. But after it, Judges 4.1 says this, After Ehud's death, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord turned them over to King Jabin of Hazor, a Canaanite king. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Agoyim. Sisera, who had 900 iron chariots, ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Deborah, the wife of Lapidoth, was a prophet who was judging Israel at that time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah, aptly named, between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites would go to her for judgment. So a couple of very interesting things here. Deborah, she's both a judge, interesting, a female judge, and prophet. She's both. Some of them are not prophets. She's judging Israel. So what she does is she summons a guy named Barak. And she says, you know what? You're going to rally up the troops. Rally up 10,000 men for me, and we're going to go to war against this King Jabin, specifically Sisera. I'm going to call him out, essentially, and we're going to have a battle. And they do. And it says that the Lord causes confusion among them, and this is what gives them the victory. Sisera, the general, hops out of his chariot, and he tries to escape. He ends up at a tent. A guy named Heber owns it. And he's in good standing with King Jabin. So Sisera thinks it's safe. Heber's not around, but his wife is. Jail. Come on in. It's going to be safe here. Puts a blanket around him. He says, I'm thirsty. She gives him milk. Must have been tired because he falls asleep. Jail decides to take a tent peg. Why? Well, it's in a tent, and women were probably tasked with pitching the tents back then. It was one of their jobs. So she's good with a tent peg and a hammer, apparently, because while he's sleeping on his side, she takes the tent peg and drives it through his head into the ground. It says, through his temple. A lot of you didn't know that was in the Bible, did you? Some gory stories. This is good stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Kills him. I said, never underestimate a woman. You could say she put him to sleep, didn't she? <laughs> if we go back, when Barak comes to Deborah, and she prophesies to him to call out the 10,000 warriors. This is what's said, Judges 4, 8. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. Very well, she replied, I will go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. Indeed, this was prophesied by a woman, and the victory was at the hands of a woman. You see, God uses those who seem weak to shame the strong time and time again you get to judges 5 we see that there's the song of deborah or the song of deborah and barak some versions say this is interesting it gives us a few more details this is really common in the psalms for example when they're singing about other things that had happened before You'll get embellishments or other details. Call it poetry. What I find more interesting about the Song of Deborah is that it is an example of a woman 
dictating Scripture. Think about it. Even the most conservative Christian would say Judges chapter 5 is God's Word. It's Scripture. And rightly so, it is. But here we have a woman dictating it. Quite interesting. So I'm glad that no one told her a woman couldn't speak in church that day. Did you know Deborah means bee, like bzz, bee, the insect. It's small. It seems weak, but it packs a powerful punch. Its sting is quite painful. I think elephants are even afraid of bees. And just as bees are led by a queen bee, so the Israelites followed Deborah. Like a small fighter who relies on leverage and wins, the victory comes as a surprise because the world sees the larger opponent as the victor automatically. But when the smaller fighter wins, he or she makes a fool of him. Like left-handed Ehud, Jael, the woman with the tent peg, or Deborah, the bee. So Christ didn't seem qualified when he was called. You see, Christ means anointed or chosen. This phrase comes from something shepherds would do to sheep. They would anoint them, which means rub or smear around the ears so the insects didn't get in. This could kill the sheep. And later, we see that kings are anointed. The priests were anointed. They poured oil over their heads. So they're anointed, chosen for the service. Jesus is the anointed one. But according to the world, this is how Christ was seen. If we go to the prophet Isaiah, it gives us a description, a prophecy of Jesus. It says this, Isaiah 53, 1, My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet, this despised, nothing good to look at, rejected son is the savior of us all. Isaiah 53, starting at verse 4, it continues. Yet, it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Jesus took the punishment for us. And this seemed foolish to the world. What? God would come and be defeated? Would die a humiliating and painful death on the cross? He was mocked? How could this be? How could God be so weak? It looked like Jesus was losing until he rose from the dead, victorious. You see, in 1 Corinthians, if we hop over to the New Testament, Paul, whom we've looked at in this series, says that this plan for God to send his son and to die was seen as foolish by the world. 1 Corinthians 1, starting at verse 18. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved, no, it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. It's a quote of Isaiah, putting things together. 
So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven. And it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But like Jesus, we shouldn't care what the world says about us. Instead, we should pay attention to what the Word says. If we keep reading 1 Corinthians, we see that not many were wise, wealthy, or powerful in the world's eyes. It says this, but to those called by God... To salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, that's us. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, the few of you who are wise in the world's eyes are powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. Through the entire word of God, we are seeing that we may seem at times weak, unqualified to the world, but God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. God uses common people. We saw even sinners. Jacob, a deceiver. Joseph, a slave. Moses, a shepherd and a murderer in exile. Rahab, a prostitute. What we should be learning from God's word in our lives as it applies to us is that you, you can be used by God powerfully. No matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what you've done, God uses those who are meek and weak by the world's standards powerfully for the kingdom of God. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church, for these people, your sons and daughters, Lord. If there's anyone listening in the sound of my voice who has not come to you yet, please draw them near. Let them surrender all to you in obedience so that every person here can be used powerfully for the building of your kingdom. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.